for myself a cup of ambition and yawn and stretch and try to come to life. Jump in the shower and the blood starts pumping out on the street. The traffic starts coming to folks like me on the job. Welcome back to Office Hours Live. Well, you know, we do what we can. Uh, I'm live, you're live, uh, we're alive. And uh, this is Office Hours Live, and that's 9 to 5. That's the high partner who still has not called in. But you know what? I have not sent her flowers yet. And so, obviously, why should she call me if I haven't sent Dolly Parton flowers? Uh, Dolly, I, I'm sorry, I haven't sent you flowers, but look, I would, I would like, if I do send you flowers, I mean, how can we work this out? If I send you flowers, will you call in? But, but how do I, but, how, will you just communicate to me that you will call in if I send you flowers? How is that, all right? We have a lot to, we have a lot to talk about in the next half hour. Um, uh, oh, please share, by the way, uh, this, we're, we're live. Share with your friends, relatives, people you like, people you dislike, uh, you know, your personal assistants, your your people who, you know, mean a lot to you, people who don't mean anything to you, but you just share this, because what's the point of doing live if you're not live, if you're not there and I'm not, you're not here? Uh, the other thing um, that I wanted to just ask you about is that, oh, I have to turn this down. Now, when when see when you don't have that background music, doesn't it? It sort of it sort of brings everything down to the practicality. I want to talk to you about yesterday's rally in Oakland, California, for Bernie Sanders, and I introduced Bernie, and I'll talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about my dinner last night with Bernie. My bit. Do you remember that film, My Dinner with Andre? Any of you? You don't. Well, it's my, my dinner with Bernie. Bernie. Um, I want to talk about politics a little bit. Uh, we have our Trump outrages of the week. And then I'll take your questions. All right? Are we all set? Okay. Oh, first of all, let me just put in a plug. The, the Golden State Warriors, they won last night. Huge, huge comeback. Woo! Great, Woo! great going, Golden State Warriors. I mean, this is, this is a great comeback, and uh, you're on to the NBA Finals. And it's a comeback... Uh, like Bernie Sanders, uh, particularly if Bernie wins next Tuesday. And we'll come back to that, uh, because right now, you should know, I, I am getting sick and tired. Can I just blow off a little steam? I'm getting sick and tired of hearing from these pundits who say that Bernie Sanders has absolutely no chance, no mathematical chance. I mean, uh, you know... What was it that Paul Krugman yesterday had an article in the Times saying, feel the math? I mean, that, that there's no mathematical possibility of Bernie Sanders getting the Democratic nomination? That is wrong. Uh, Paul, I know you. You know me. You just, you blew it. You don't understand this stuff. I mean, here, right now, and we're just going to talk about pledged delegates because the unpledged, I mean, that is the people who are superdelegates, they could go in either direction. Uh, they are just Democratic insiders. All right, so the real important people are the pledged delegates. And if Bernie gets enough pledged delegates, and presumably if uh, Hillary Clinton's polls uh, keep falling, then the superdelegates may come over to Bernie. So here we are in pledged. Uh, now, Hillary has 1,770. Uh, actually, if you want to be technical about it, it's 1,769. Bernie has 1,500. Actually, technically, 1,501. Uh, and the difference between them, you mathematicians who say feel the math, is 270. All right? Do you get that math? Hello, Paul? Are you, do you have a pencil and paper with you, Paul? Uh, so, uh, and California alone, now the California primary is next Tuesday. California alone has 475 pledged delegates to allocate. Now, you do the math. I mean, if there's a complete blowout, in California, and there may be. It is not impossible that there could be a blowout. Suppose there is a blowout, and suppose, for example, that Hillary Clinton gets uh, only 100 of those delegates, and let's say Bernie Sanders gets 375. 
I, that means that Bernie pulls ahead of Hillary, and that's just California. That doesn't include what happens in North Dakota, Dakota or South Dakota also have primaries. Uh, or Montana or New Jersey also have primaries. And you've got uh, the District of Columbia coming up on the 14th of June. And you've got Puerto Rico uh, coming up uh, even sooner than that. And the Virgin Islands uh, on the 4th and the 5th of, of, of this month. I mean, do you understand, of, of June, do you understand the math? I mean, the math could be working in Bernie's favor. He's got the momentum. He's like the, the Golden State Warriors, the comeback kid. Uh, yesterday in Oakland, uh, I had the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing Bernie Sanders to a crowd estimated at 30,000 people. Now, that's from the police in Oakland. That's the latest estimate from the Oakland police. They say actually 30,000 to 60,000. Now, I can tell you, I was there. I have never seen so many people in my life in one place. And uh, getting up there and, and talking to them and introducing Bernie was a little bit, you know, I, I mean, it was a little, it was thrilling and intimidating at the same time. I mean, you get up, you get up in front of thirty to 60,000 people. And what was in my head when I was introducing Bernie, I didn't have a script. What was in my head was uh, supposing I blow this or supposing I faint or supposing I, you know, accidentally uh, I say, uh, you know, sort of something terrible, or or I I emit a swear word, or or I just you know fall over. I mean, anything can happen in front of thirty to sixty thousand people. So I, well, you, I don't know how many of you have spoken in front of thirty to sixty thousand people. Have you done that? No. Do you want to do that? No. Well, I mean, it, it's one of the nightmares. I mean, when I was a kid, I had nightmares about standing up and speaking. Uh, before hundreds of people, well, try thirty to 60,000. Anyway, uh, it was a great rally. Uh, the newspapers uh, and the media have not reported thirty to 60,000. This is a huge event. This is one of the largest gatherings uh, in the entire campaign, and it shows how much momentum Bernie Sanders actually has. This is an extraordinary, and was an extraordinary, group of enthusiastic people. And then uh, Bernie and I, uh, last night, had dinner my dinner with Bernie. Uh, and the thing about Bernie Sanders that you need to understand, we went into this little restaurant here in Berkeley. Uh, it was late. Uh, the, uh, I, had, I had called the fellow who owned the restaurant because I wanted to make sure that he knew that Bernie Sanders and I were coming in so he wasn't surprised. Uh, but it was fine. We, we took a booth in the back. Bernie Sanders in person is exactly like Bernie Sanders in public. There is no difference. I have known many, many politicians in my life. I've known some presidents. I have worked with people who are presidential candidates and senators and senatorial candidates and Congress people. And sometimes there's a big difference between who they are in public and who they are privately. In fact, I won't name names, but there is a difference. Bernie Sanders is exactly the same person. Uh, just the two of us had dinner, and uh, uh, he, uh, he, had, he wouldn't mind me telling you. He had fish and chips and a Coke. Is that okay if I tell you that? I mean, it's, it's not all that personal. I'm not going to reveal anything really personal, because he didn't tell me anything personal, and I wouldn't have revealed it anyway. Uh, and I had uh, chicken, and we sat there, and uh, we had a conversation about, about big ideas and, uh, and also the campaign and what's going on. And, and he's, uh, he's fired up, and he's, the man has so much energy. Uh, and and I, I asked him, where does he get his just his, his continuous energy to go through a presidential campaign, believe me, it is not like even running for state office because running for state office or running for Senate, you know, you have a beginning and you have an end, but this thing doesn't end. It goes on for a year, for a year and a half. It just goes on. Uh, and this is a man who is about my age and I, you know, I have energy. Hello, I've got energy. I do, uh, I do uh, push-ups and I do... Uh, in the morning, I do uh, all kinds of things, you know. I mean, exercises. I, I keep in shape, reasonable shape. But Bernie Sanders is, uh, I mean, his, his, his just, his energy amazes me. And I asked him where he gets all his energy, and he said, well, basically, 
uh, from young people. I mean, he's, he's on the campaign trail. There are a lot of young people around him who have huge ideal, idealism, huge energy. Uh, he is continuing. And this is true of almost every state he has been in. Uh, he gets the majority of people under 45. Uh, and from where I am sitting, 45 doesn't seem like a youth vote, right? I mean, 45-year-olds used to be middle-aged, but he's got almost everybody under 45. Uh, and that tells a lot about the future of America uh, and gives me a great confidence in the future of America. Uh, so we had a nice dinner, and we talked about everything. Uh, we talked about the campaign. We talked about his life uh, and his hopes. And, uh, well, it was just... It was just uh, Again, Bernie Sanders. It was Bernie Sanders. Uh, which brings us to the part of this program where I want to get, I, I, I need to vent. I need to let off a little steam. Do you mind? Uh, this is therapeutic for me, and maybe it's useful for you. I don't know. But I, I just want to talk to you about what this week has meant with regard to Trump land. I'm going to call it Trump land from now on because it is a different country. In fact, it's a different planet. Maybe I should call it the planet Trump uh, because the Trump is off on his own bizarre journey. I mean, the first thing he did, he told the Republican National Committee that he is low on cash, that he needs more money. He told the Republican senators he needs more money. Now, this is a man who, during the campaign, remember, he said he was not dependent on anybody, and therefore he could be trusted by the electorate because he was so rich. He had $8 billion. In fact, he was he was insulted when people said he only had $4 billion. He said, no, no, I have $8 billion, and by the way, I'm not going to be dependent on anybody because I am a self-made man. Now, okay, now that he's secured the nomination for the Republican Party, what is he doing? He's going around telling Republicans he doesn't have any money. And so they have got to cough up money. I mean, the Republican Party, they have actually now nominated a deadbeat. They, um, they nominated a deadbeat. This is called the art of the deal. This is how Trump operates. I mean, he will get people uh, committed, he'll tell lies, he'll do anything he needs to do to get people in a position where they can then be extorted by him for money or for whatever else he wants. Why didn't Republicans see this coming? So now Republicans, and what, what does Trump have over the Republicans? Why should they cough up money? Because he's going to be the head of the ticket. And what we know is that that person at the head of the ticket affects how people vote on the rest of the ticket. Because a lot of people, just if they, if they check the person at the head of the ticket, they go right down Republican, Republican, Republican. So there are a lot of Republican senators, Republican members of Congress, other Republican establishment figures that are very dependent on Trump, Trump, Trump winning. And so he's got them in the palm of his hand. He can say, give me money now, because if you don't give me money, maybe I'll lose. Maybe I won't put up the biggest of the, the fight. Trump this week also, he slammed New Mexico uh, uh, Republican Governor Susana Martinez. Now, she had the effrontery not to come to one of Trump's rallies. New Mexico has a primary this coming Tuesday, the New Mexico primary is an important primary. It's not as big as the California primary. It's still important. And she snubbed Trump, or he felt it was a snub. She said she had other things to do. And so he went after her. He told the crowd that she had allowed in to New Mexico thousands of Syrian refugees. And everybody booed. Now, the interesting thing about that is not only is that Trump's absolute, uh, and, you know, that, this is the way he operates. This is his, this is his theme song. Uh, anybody who, who, who brings in Syrian refugees is bad, is endangering America? Well, he's saying she's bringing in thousands of them. First of all, she hasn't brought in thousands. Uh, in fact, she's brought in, she's allowed in. She doesn't even have any say over this. It's the federal government. The governors can't determine. But only 10 Syrian refugees have come into New Mexico. 10. So in one fell swoop, Trump is drumming up hate toward Syrian refugees. He's using his uh, hyperbolic, he's using lies, and he's, and, he's, and he's making people even more 
prejudice, and he is also intimidating a, a, a fellow Republican. This is how, how he operates. And thirdly, he tried this week to intimidate Judge Gonzalez Curiel. Now, Judge Curiel out of San Diego is now the presiding judge over a trial where there's a lawsuit against Trump University, calling Trump University a sham. And, and Donald Trump doesn't like the way this federal judge has been operating this trial. And so he slammed the federal judge. He went after the federal judge, called him shameful for what he is doing, said he shouldn't be a federal judge, called him a, a Mexican. Well, Donald Trump? I mean, this is an American. How could he become a federal judge if he weren't an American? This is, again, is Donald Trump using intimidation, intimidation in this case, try, attempted intimidation of a federal judge and using and trying to stoke prejudice and hatefulness and bias? Friends, do we want this person as president of the United States? Does this man have the temperament to be president of the United States? So look, we we have a we have a choice. Right now, Bernie Sanders has a real chance to be the Democratic nominee. I don't care what Paul Krugman or anybody else says he has a real chance. And a lot of it depends on what happens Tuesday, next Tuesday, week from today, in California. And we have at the other end, at the other extreme, this authoritarian, bigoted, extraordinarily dangerous character called Trump. And he could become our president. And it's up to you and it's up to me to make sure he doesn't. Okay, I got that off my chest. <coughs> oh, don't, uh, we're now going on to your, your questions. Uh, please share, uh, this is live, and your questions, we have time for a lot of questions. I'm going to go through these questions very fast. Uh, from Dorothea Standish, I could not see you at all at the rally in Oakland, but was very pleased to hear your introduction of Bernie Sanders. Well, Dorothea, you couldn't see me because I'm pretty short. Uh, okay, this is from Mark uh, Byford. Do you think it would be good to have Elizabeth Warren as vice president on the Democratic Democratic ticket? Yes. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Coriel Carr. Does a candidate have to relinquish ownership or holdings in a company while running? A candidate? No. Why are we going through these fast? Huh? Pretty good. Susie Myers, uh, do you have Hillary Rodham Clinton's ear? I don't think it's around here at all. I, I haven't seen it anywhere. Uh, no, I don't. Well, I, I mean, I've known Hillary uh, since she was 19 years old, but I haven't talked to her recently. Uh, Janin Austin, is that Jamie Austin? Uh, what do you think of the rumor that the establishment Democrats will try to parachute a... Uh, Biden, oh, Biden, Warren ticket into the DNC convention uh, to combat any Clinton email scandal issues. Well, I haven't heard anything like that, and I don't know how you can parachute into a DNC convention anyway. Uh, but uh, look, if there is, I don't, I don't want to stoke paranoia and all of. You know, uh, there may be some stuff there. Uh, I just, uh, I, you know, it's easy to blow the email uh, stuff out of proportion. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, and I will give Hillary Clinton the benefit of the doubt. As I said, I've worked with her, and I've known her since she was uh, 19 years old. Uh, in fact, I, I think I, I talked to you before. I, I once out, went out on a date with Hillary in college. It wasn't really a date. Let me be very, very specific about this. Uh, we did go to see Antonioni's blow up. Uh, and uh, I told the New York Times she wanted an inordinate amount of butter on her popcorn. Uh, but it wasn't really a date. She was president of her freshman class at Wellesley. I was president of my sophomore class at Dartmouth. I asked her if she wanted to come up for a presidential summit. Okay, Justin Van Wy, What would you think about advocating for publicly financed prim primary debates, uh, publicly financed exit polls? Uh, would these things be feasible? Well, Justin, 
I suppose it would be feasible, but I don't know why we need publicly public. I would I would rather we work on public financing of uh, of actual elections. I think that's the most important priority. Uh, and last week, uh, the Democrats in Congress, some of the Democrats, introduced a bundle or planned to introduce. They announced that they were planning to introduce a bundle of legislation on campaign finance reform, uh, which were all good, good ideas. What they left out. Uh, was public financing of elections. That is, uh, you have, and, and it's done in some states, uh, the government provides a certain n amount of matching funds for every small donor. Uh, this is a good idea. Uh, we need it in the United States. Uh, even if we cannot reverse Citizens United, we could do this, and it would be a big, big help. Uh, Rona Beitler, do you have any feelings or words of advice for the well over a one million expected to go to Philadelphia as to how to make their voices heard to those inside the conventions. Uh, well, Rona, if you're going, you're talking about the Philadelphia Democratic Convention, number one, avoid, and I mean this very sincerely, avoid violence. I remember in, in 1968, I wasn't too far away from that Democratic National Committee in 1968. Uh, some of you, it may seem like I'm talking ancient history, Greeks, Romans, 1968 Democratic National Committee, uh, but that was awful. Uh, so avoid violence uh, and, uh, and, and demonstrate peacefully if you are going to go there. Uh, be very clear about why you're there and what you want, and make sure that everything you do contributes to the development, and this is really a, a different, a, we'll, we'll talk about this in the future, the development of a progressive movement. Uh, we've already launched it. I mean, Bernie Sanders has already launched it in America. Uh, many of you have been involved. Many of you have been involved even before Bernie Sanders. Uh, but we've got to come together, all of us, uh, and create a movement that counterbalances the moneyed interests that have taken over our democracy and our economy. Uh, Alex West, why, in your opinion, did Jerry Brown just endorse Hillary Clinton? Uh, well, Alex, I don't know exactly, but a lot of politicians who are now governors and senators and others uh, endorse the candidate who is the establishment candidate because they expect the establishment is going to win and they want to be on the winning side. And a lot of governors want to be on the winning side because they know that a president has a lot of discretion about uh, handing out federal contracts and, and, and making a state uh, either more prosperous or less prosperous. Uh, and so it matters to be on the winning side. In fact, even, even a bunch of labor leaders uh, who I know know better, uh, they've endorsed Hillary Clinton because they all live in Washington. They want to be on, they want to be known as one of the people who, uh, you know, endorsed who they think is on the winning side uh, early because they want to, you know, get the benefits uh, of presidential favoritism and they want to go to the White House Christmas party. Uh, Dave Jones, oh, by the way, um, last night over dinner, and I don't think I'm giving away confidences, uh, Bernie said that uh, if he's president, he will invite me to the White House Christmas party. Ooh. Hey. Hey. Big deal. Uh, Dave Jones, how much did you have to pay to have dinner with a presidential candidate? Uh, Dave, I didn't pay a dime. I was ready to pay for the dinner. I mean, I, you know, I had my, my, uh, my credit card out, uh, but he paid. Okay, Alicia Watts, uh, feels like you are giving up. Please don't. Alicia, how can you say it feels like I'm giving up? I mean, wait a minute, didn't we, didn't I talk about, didn't I talk about this? Quite the contrary. I mean, Bernie Sanders has, in my view, still a chance, and I think it is a reasonable chance, uh, and California and the California primary is going to be very important. Uh, Vanessa Karn, how can you be so hypocritical? Vanessa, how can you be so hypocritical urging us to vote for Bernie in the primaries, but also urging us to vote for Hillary if Hillary becomes the Democratic nominee? Vanessa, this is not hypocritical. I mean, it is not inconsistent to ask people to vote for Bernie Sanders, to be out there for Bernie, uh, uh, to do everything I possibly can uh, to make Bernie the nominee. But if it turns out that he is not the nominee, uh, then what are we going to do? What are we going to do? If we don't vote and support Hillary Clinton, then what's the, well, what's happened? We, we actually, de facto, we were supporting Donald Trump. 
And I, you know, I don't equate the two. I'm sorry. Donald Trump is a menace. He is a serious danger to the future of our country and the future of the world. Uh, Peter Nathan. Uh, Bernie is polling much better than Hillary in matchup polls against Trump. Is Bernie really the stronger candidate, or is this just because he hasn't been in the Republican bullseye? Uh, well, Peter, I think that Bernie actually is a stronger candidate. Now, obviously, part of the reason he's polling better is that he has not been as criticized as Hillary Clinton, uh, but part of it also is that uh, Bernie has is the, is the anti-establishment candidate. Uh, Donald Trump in his own weird way, and it's kind of the authoritarian anti-establishment candidate. And this is an era in which anti-establishment candidates are coming to the fore because the public doesn't want politics as usual. The public is, is, is finished with politics as usual. I mean, Donald Trump has never run before. He's not a, he's not a candidate in, in the typical way. He's not a, a politician in the typical way. Bernie Sanders uh, is not a typical Democrat. Was not. Neither of these men were members of the parties that they are. Trump is now going to be leading, and Bernie Sanders wants to be leading, uh, and that is why they are so attractive to so many people, and particularly so many young people for whom politics is anathema. And so I think Bernie Sanders has a much better chance against Trump. Okay, Ben Modulus. Uh, do you think the superdelegates are likely to see the light regarding Hillary being an extremely risky candidate to run against Trump? Uh, ben, I don't know, but I do know that if her polls keep dropping and also if Bernie keeps on a roll and does very well and, and wins California, uh, then more superdelegates are going to see the light and they will come over to him and they'll understand that he's going to be a stronger candidate. Uh, Joe uh, Kupchu, did I get that right, Joe? Uh, what is the current status of the new documentary, Saving Capitalism? Has the filming started? Greatly looking forward to it. Uh, Joe, we're, we're starting. Uh, yes, the filming has started. We're working on it. Uh, Jake Kornbluth and Yael and a bunch of people are already busy at work. Uh, and I've started working, working on it when I haven't been doing this and supporting Bernie Sanders and doing my other work. Okay, Wendy uh, Dabovich, what would happen if the election came down to uh, the Supreme Court of the United States? as it did in the W election. The W election? Bush. Bush. Bush Gore. The Bush. Oh, the Bush. <laughs> the Bush. I, my, my memory is failing me. Of course, <laughs> W is George W. Bush. Uh, what if, uh, if the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, is tied? Uh, Wendy, look, at, you're raising a very important question, because in the background of everything I have said today, obviously, is the appointment of the next Supreme Court justice, or two, or three. The next president may have two or three justices. The justices are fairly old. Most of the justices are over 70 years old. Now, that's not all that old. As I get closer to 70, it doesn't seem old to me at all, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the, next, uh, the next Supreme Court justice clearly is going to be appointed by the next president, uh, assuming that the Senate does not confirm uh, the uh, current nominee by the uh, administration, Obama administration, and uh, there are going to be two or three, and so that's going to be critically important because the Supreme Court is making all of those fundamental decisions, not just about social issues, but about economic issues, interpreting the Constitution, interpreting uh, federal statutes. Uh, we have got to have a Supreme Court that is on the side of the people, uh, and this Supreme Court, the Roberts Supreme Court, has not been. Uh, here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that I testified at the hearings on the nomination of Justice Roberts to be confirmed to the Supreme Court? Did you know that? I was called, and I testified against him. I said that he would be a terrible justice uh, and that the Senate would be very wise not to confirm him. And they did not listen to me. Once again, when I'm not listened to, you see what happens? <laughs> Tiffany Landry, I'm considering leaving the Democratic Party next week after voting as a protest against the Democratic leadership. If lots of others do the same, would it be an effective form of protest or would it do more harm than good? Tiffany, if you leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, now listen to me, there is no Democratic Party. 
uh, there is just a bunch of people uh, who are sort of Democratic office holders and, uh, and insider Democrats, and if you left, they won't know you left. Uh, even if a lot of people left, they won't know that a lot of people left. Unless you leave to join another party that really is capable of contesting the Democratic Party. Now, we have got to talk about, we're not going to, we don't have time today, but we will talk about this issue of a third party. Uh, because it will be, it is looming on the horizon uh, as a big, big issue. It's very hard in a winner-take-all system like the United States. We're not a parliamentary system like uh, Britain or much of Europe or other democracies and republics. We are a parliamentary system. We are a winner-take-all system, not a parliamentary system, which means that we are a winner-take-all system. Very hard in a winner-take-all system to have a third party, but it has happened. One more. And this better be good. Bronwyn Fryer, if Bernie wins and invites you to the White House holiday party, you should invite Dolly. Bronwyn, what a great idea. Maybe then my book at my bucket list will be full. <laughs> and let me just uh I wanna thank you. I we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wind this up. I just want to Speaking of Dolly Parton. I want to thank Zoe Umlaud Beck and Yael Bridge for their extraordinary assistance. And uh, we'll see you at this time, at this time, next Tuesday, this place. And next Tuesday, again, is going to be a very important primary day in California, New Mexico, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, New Jersey. Don't forget to vote.